This is Everyday Wellness, a podcast dedicated to helping you achieve your health and wellness goals and provide practical strategies that you can use in your real life. And now, here is your host, nurse practitioner Cynthia Thurlow. So excited to have Dr. Saladino. He is the leading authority on the science and application of the carnivore diet. I have just finished the carnivore code, which I highly recommend. He has used this diet to reverse autoimmunity, chronic inflammation, and mental health issues in hundreds of patients, many of whom had been told their conditions were untreatable. He is the host of the popular Fundamental Health Podcast and author of the best-selling book, as I mentioned earlier, The Carnivore Code in 2019. He's also currently working on the companion Carnivore Code cookbook to be released in late 2020. So nice to have you here with me this afternoon. And thank you again for getting up early to uh, connect. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Well, I really, with you know, great respect and admiration, uh, you know, dove into your book and was very pleasantly surprised to kind of hear about your story. And and I always think the background of what got us to where we are today is really relevant. And so, obviously, I know about your background, but I know my listeners would appreciate hearing a little bit more about it. And I love that you started as a PA in cardiology because I worked as an NP in cardiology for 16 years. So I'm all about the heart. Um, And I think that is one of the best specialties to be in to really see what metabolic uh, inflexibility and metabolic disease really does and ravages to the bodies. But I'd love for you to share your story. Yeah, I I grew up in Northern Virginia, right where you are, in DC. <laughs> my dad is a physician, he's an internist, and my mom is a nurse practitioner. Mm-hmm. She does diabetes care. They're both pretty much retired now. They're about to be 70 years old this year, but medicine was in my blood mm-hmm. from an early age and I was always fascinated by it. And as I describe in the book, I think that I, I'm an engineer and I became a doctor. I, I think like an engineer in the sense that I, I'm interested in the root cause of things. Mm-hmm. And when I, even when I was growing up, I would go to the hospital with my dad and, and think, why is that person struggling to breathe? Why did that person have a heart attack? And even from a young age, I was fixated on atherosclerosis. I didn't mm-hmm. call it that when I was a kid. It was heart disease and heart attacks, mm-hmm. but it just seemed so final <laughs> and mm-hmm. it was killing so many people. I mean, heart disease is you know a huge, huge killer that I asked my dad, what causes heart disease? And he said, we don't know. Well, that's not a satisfactory answer. (laughs) So, you know, I went to college at William Mary and studied uh, chemistry and biology. And actually, uh, an interesting part of my story is that that I I took six years off after college, got a little burned out, did a lot of traveling, uh, which I'm sure shaped the way that I saw the world after Mm -hmm. that. I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail from Mexico to Canada, spent a lot of time in the mountains, mountaineering and exploring and skiing and backcountry skiing. And then eventually... remembered that I was very curious about biology and chemistry Mm -hmm. and really wanted to get back to science. My first, you know, foray back into science and into graduate school was to go to George Washington University to become a PA. And I practiced in cardiology for four years. What I quickly realized once I was a PA and practicing was that I was disappointed and I was going to have to go back Mm -hmm. to medical school for me (laughs) because until I was in medicine, I didn't realize how broken the paradigm Mm -hmm. appeared to be and how broken the paradigm was. From the outside, it looks really cool. Oh, I get to use these interesting drugs and I get to read EKGs and lipids are interesting and cardiovascular physiology is interesting. Connections with diabetes and endocrinology Mm -hmm. are interesting. And what I saw in practice on the ground in the hospital and in the clinic was even though I worked with physicians who were well-intentioned and very intelligent, I was instructed to keep my focus within the heart box Mm-hmm. and not to think outside of the heart box, not to think holistically. And also there was not a whole lot of curiosity or ability for any of us to really think about what the root cause of these issues mm-hmm. was. What is causing atherosclerosis? Don't we want to know what diet causes atherosclerosis? Don't we want to know mm-hmm. if, if there are things that are worsening heart failure or what actually causes hypertension? I mean, how many patients go to the physician, go to their physicians and get told they have high blood pressure and you get this, Mm-hmm. And, oh, it's bad genes. You have a family history. We call mm-hmm. it idiopathic or primary hypertension. And we just accept it in medicine as this is your bad lot in life. You got dealt a poker hand with a hypertension card. And I always thought that is unsatisfactory. I don't mm-hmm. buy it one bit. And so I went back to medical school at the University of Arizona with the intention of doing something 
holistic and I got an MD. So that's mm-hmm. just the traditional route, but mm-hmm. I wanted to try and integrate things. And there are so many words that are used now for this type of medicine and all of them are inadequate. Functional medicine, integrative mm-hmm. medicine, holistic medicine. It should really just be medicine, mm-hmm. but I wanted to practice medicine where I could ask the questions on my own, what is causing these illnesses? And so after that, I did residency at the University of Washington, uh, originally in psychiatry. Uh, I became board certified in psychiatry. And I went into psychiatry because at that time in my life, I thought I need to start with narrative and I want to start with story. I'd seen cardiology and I wanted to start with narrative and story and understand what made someone tick. Mm -hmm. And the mental health issues were really interesting to me and they're pervasive. Your listeners may know that depression causes the most morbidity, the most loss of quality of life in the world. Depression is the number one loss of quality of life and morbidity in the world. And again, it was the same paradigm. My colleagues were not interested or weren't able to, or just weren't challenged to ask the questions, what the heck is causing mental illness? What is causing depression? What is causing anxiety? What is causing psychotic disorders? What is causing bipolar disorder? And so I saw the same pattern repeated over and over in my medical journey. We're just not very good at medicine, in medicine at asking these questions about where things come from. I've since left psychiatry. I'm more of an anti-psychiatrist now than I am a psychiatrist. I think that, because I think that thinking about medicine and illness from a specialty perspective doesn't serve the patient. Mm. Um, I've gone back and gotten board certified in nutrition you know, as, a, as an MD, and, and I really practice and think holistically, for lack of a better word, I think that the same things cause depression as heart disease. Mm-hmm. And, and in cardiology, we know this, but it's not talked about that often, that people who have heart attacks are at a much higher risk of depression, and people who have depression mm-hmm. are at a much higher risk of heart attacks. And so the whole idea that we can balkanize or silo medicine into individual specialties is a great disservice to our patients. Certainly there are, there's a need for specialists when there are procedures and Mm -hmm. proceduralists, but ideologically, I think that to be able to say to someone, whether it's a PA in cardiology or a nurse practitioner in cardiology or a physician in cardiology or endocrinology or psychiatry, think up here, think in the brain box, because you're a psychiatrist or you do, you do, Mm -hmm. you do, you know, you work with a brain or think in the heart box, you're a cardiologist. That is a failure in my opinion. And it's, we, it's all obviously connected. So here I am now, um, you know, I'm still board certified in psychiatry and nutrition and I just, I practice holistically. I don't think of specialties as a good thing for patients. And I think it's all connected. And that's the beginning of sort of my, my diet journey and my interest in diets and animal-based diets. Well, it's so powerful. And and I, I believe that a lot of what you're sharing, uh, you know, within my own personal experience is really uh, aligned. I got to a point where I finally started telling my peers, I'm tired of writing prescriptions. I actually want to do the real work. But, you know, patients are so conditioned to believe that a symptom needs to be treated with a pill. We've conditioned them to to think this way. And they they get the validation by watching TV and seeing infomercials from pharmaceutical companies. And so, you know, for me, it was much more powerful to be able to sit down with a patient and talk to them about food, like especially my obese diabetic patients. And I would say, okay, let's talk about carbohydrates. And I would have people that would go to the well-meaning registered dietitian and then they would come back and and I would say, okay, so what are you eating in a given day? And my diabetic patient would say, oh, I had six bananas. And I said, you realize you have a sugar problem, right? And they would say, well, yeah, but it's a piece of fruit. And I said, but you have a sugar handling problem and six bananas a day is way more carbohydrates than you should be eating. And so for me, I, I pivoted from uh, traditional Western medicine four years ago to become an entrepreneur. Same thing, did nutrition training because I felt like that was more powerful. The lifestyle piece is what we're not trained to focus on and yet it is the most important piece. Um, so everything that you're saying really, really resonates. So you went from <clears throat> starting as a PA in cardiology, morphing into um, having many years where you were active and it sounds like you did a lot of physical things, came back to medicine, um, now pivoted again. And and so where did you find for yourself that, you know, the carnivore diet, because that's really what you're you're known for at this point, what occurred to you that that, because that, that isn't such a, 
I would say, you know, five, 10 years ago, that was not a common theme in terms of the nutritional paradigms that we see. And so what was, what was the light bulb moment for you? I know that you share in your book that you've had some autoimmune issues. And so for you, what was the light bulb moment that allowed you to kind of pivot and consider that might be contributing? Yeah, it was really my own eczema and asthma, which were from childhood. And they got much worse in medical school and residency to the point at times that I once or twice became septic. I did a lot of jujitsu when I was in medical school and would have pretty severe eczema flares on my knees and elbows and then super infected with um, impetigo and, oh, you know, can remember being, you know, <laughs> oh, feverish and, you know, basically septic at my mm-hmm. house in medical school with, with super infected eczema and, and, and issues wow. like that. So it got to be so severe and I'll back up one more step and, and bring the listeners back a little bit to make it uh, contextual, but from the beginning or not from the beginning, but as soon as I really got into medicine as a PA, I realized it's food, it's gotta be food. And so in the intervening 15 years between then and now, I've thought about food a lot and iterated around food for myself. I had seven months as a raw vegan in which I lost 30 pounds of muscle mass and didn't have any fat to lose. I just lost 30 pounds of muscle, had horrible GI issues, persistent gas and bloating and really uncomfortable, but was convinced at that time or brainwashed, I should say, or just, I was bought into the idea that, oh no, meat is bad for me. And Mm -hmm. these these raw plants, this is what I should be eating. And clearly didn't work. Didn't work for me. I don't think it works for anyone. That's a whole separate story. Added some meat back to my diet and the following 10 to 12 years were uh, mostly organic paleo. So Mm -hmm. cutting out, I had periods where I had dairy in my diet, but I tried to do fermented dairy or raw Mm -hmm. dairy. I always chose the best type of dairy. I learned that dairy doesn't work for me immunologically, no matter what I do, but I also cut out grains and legumes Mm -hmm. and I saw an improvement in my muscle mass and I felt better and my GI symptoms got way better and someone could actually be around me. A funny story is that I was working as a physician assistant when I was doing my vegan phase and I shared an office with two other nurse practitioners who I just, I feel bad for them to this day because of how bad that office smelled because I farted so much. It was so bad. Too much fiber. <laughs> too much fiber, too much, just too much. It was so bad for me. Um, and I've heard the same story over and over. In fact, uh, a woman messaged me on Instagram today and said, uh, she said, thanks so much for the work you do. Texas is opening back up now from coronavirus. Uh, I'm going to go eat a steak and some eggs and go to the gym. And I, and I looked at her profile and, it, you know, a month or two months ago, her, she has a shirt that says vegan. And I messaged her and said, aren't you a vegan? She said, oh no, after seven years of being a vegan, I couldn't handle, handle all the farting and all the GI issues. <laughs> now I'm animal based and I feel so much better. Thanks for your work. And I thought, that's amazing. That's a lot like my story. Mm-hmm. But after the vegan phase, I did the paleo phase, the eczema continued. Okay. And that was my impetus to continue iterating, to continue mm-hmm. looking into why, why am I still having eczema? It's, I really believe it is a food trigger. And if you go to the dermatologist, they're not going to tell you this. The mainstream thinking is, oh, your skin is too dry. You need to put on this. Topical hydrocortisone. Yes. You need to put on these topical steroids Mm -hmm. or you need to put on this uh, CeraVe cream, which has phthalates and parabens. And it's just a problem with your skin. You live in a dry area. No, it's total Mm -hmm. baloney. It's autoimmune. And more often than not, it's a food trigger. So I kept Mm -hmm. iterating around that and thinking, what can I take out of my diet? So my paleo diet gradually became autoimmune paleo, which is where you eliminate nuts and seeds and grains and legumes and dairy. And then I eliminated nightshades. And then I thought, oh, well, maybe it's not that, maybe it's histamine. So I had to get low histamine foods. And then I eliminated oxalates. And by this time, there's not many plants left. (laughs) When you go down the rabbit hole of plant toxins and how many things there are in plants, whether it's oxalates, lectins, um, I would, I would even argue that some polyphenolic compounds can be very triggering to people immunologically. Um, but certainly phytic acid, histamine, all of these compounds, salicylates, mm-hmm. sorolins, uh, and things like carrots and parsnips. There, there's just so many families of plant compounds, and we can dig into all this mm-hmm. that you need to eliminate that suddenly there were not very many plants left in my diet. I was eating basically avocado and berries and lettuce. Mm-hmm. And, and I still had eczema. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I did this experiment with 
um, some quote medicinal mushrooms where I took chaga and reishi and mm -hmm. turkey tail and my eczema got the worst it had ever been. It was head to toe. I remember mm -hmm. going on a walk um, with a friend and she said, what happened to you? And I was too embarrassed to tell her that it was eczema. And I said that I fell into a patch of poison ivy. <laughs> and that was what it looked like. I mean, I had, I had all over my hands, my arms, mm -hmm. wrist, wrist to shoulder, uh, you know, just full of uh, this, this id reaction, we would call it in medicine from the eczema being so pervasive. Mm -hmm. and, and I, temporally, I associate that with doing large doses of mushrooms that are considered to be very in vogue today, but I mm -hmm. think also have oxalates and many compounds which can trigger the immune system. And so at that point, the light bulb kind of went on in my head and I said, you know what, why am I even eating plants? And I had to wrestle with a lot of my indoctrination because mm -hmm. I had gone through the training to become certified as a functional medicine practitioner. I did training through the Institute of Functional Medicine. I got an, you know, an IFMCP certification, which is a long, arduous certification. And within that set of ideology, plant compounds are good for us and fiber is good for us and yada, yada. And I thought, man, this is really going against my training, um, but I'm just gonna go with it. I'm gonna just eliminate all plants. And, and I felt more comfortable eliminating all plants when I thought, why am I not eliminating plants? Like, what do I really need? Well, fiber. And I did the research on fiber and we can dig into this as well and realized, mm -hmm. Hey, the story we've been told about fiber is a little bit, a little bit misconstrued. I don't really think that humans need fiber, at least from the literature. So mm -hmm. I felt comfortable eliminating fiber. And then when I looked at polyphenols and the research around that, I realized, I don't think we need these either. And then I looked at the nutrient research for vitamins and minerals and quickly realized wait a minute, if I eat animals nose to tail, which I'm a huge advocate for, which is eating not just muscle meat, but also the organs, connective tissue, bone broths, collagen, and things like liver and mm -hmm. other organs and animals. If I'm eating animals nose to tail, like I believe our ancestors would have, and as we observe currently living indigenous groups today to do, mm -hmm. there's really no nutrients that I'm gonna be missing. And the listener will probably say, what about vitamin C? And we can get into that as well. Yeah. but. The quick answer there is there's definitely vitamin C in animal foods, mm -hmm. plenty to prevent scurvy. So I was kind of at this position where I thought, okay, I don't, there's nothing I need to get from plants. I can get everything I need from animals. The fiber story is kind of misleading. The polyphenol story is very misleading. I'm just going to do this. And of course, all of those are rabbit holes that we can go down. All of those are rabbit holes that I elaborate on in much more detail mm -hmm. in my book, The Carnivore Code. But the end of the story is that within a few weeks, my eczema was completely gone. Very quickly, I realized something was different about the way that I saw the world. Psychologically, I had this change. Within the first week of doing an uh, animal-based diet without any plant foods, I just was more positive in general. I, I was much more calm and something was different about the way that I was viewing the world and living in the world. This is my own subjective experience, but I've heard people repeat it many times that they, not only do the GI symptoms get better, and I think that I, yes, I probably farted less uh, once I cut out the plant foods, but my eczema got better, my autoimmunity got better, my mood got better. I didn't even really think that I was angry or anxious or depressed, mm -hmm. but my mood got better. And things just were so interesting that I went down that rabbit hole and that, that all began about two years ago. And since then I've been on this journey and doing my own podcast. I wrote this book and here we are. No, I'm so grateful that you did write the book because I, you know, I, I have the opportunity to get my hands on a lot of the literature and books that are out there. And, and I was probably two chapters into your book and reached out to you on Instagram or it was Twitter and basically said, I would really love to bring you on the podcast because there's such great information here. And I think for so many of us, it's surprising. I too was paleo, got sick last year, got septic when I came out of the hospital um, after surgeries and all sorts of things that went on. The only thing my body tolerated after being hardcore paleo for years, I was already gluten, grains, dairy free, was meat. And it was humbling the first four months uh, when I was home to realize that that is, that is the most basic, easiest thing for our bodies to be able to assimilate, break down. And what was interesting for me is coming out of the hospital, losing 15 pounds, looking very sickly because I'm not a very, I'm not a very big person and 15 pounds was a lot, was that when I ate meat and I, and I was consistently eating meat and eating good quality meat, um, 
I was finding that my mood, considering everything I'd been through was great. And so we start talking about food and mood, neurotransmitters, the bulk of which are produced in our in our guts uh, and not so much in our brains, which is contrary to what we think about when we think about um, antidepressant therapy. And obviously you are the expert in this area, but uh, was really, really surprising and very humbling. And, and I recall that a colleague of mine was like, I wouldn't tell a lot of people you're eating carnivore. Isn't that kind of like an extreme diet. And I was like, no, well, first of all, it's not a diet. Uh, but is that extreme? Like he was thinking of it like veganism. And I said, no, 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 no. Um, I think if you really look at the research and look at the literature, um, it's really, really compelling. And I want to, I want to, there was one clip that I wanted to read from your book. And so for a lot of the people that come to me and are working with me, everyone is smoothie obsessed and everyone loves kale. And so I call kale killer kale. And I have to give a nod to a colleague who uses that Terry Cochran. So kale doesn't love you back. Broccoli is just not that into you. And spinach isn't a real friend. So I use that as a segue into, you know, jumping, diving into another topic, but it's the the focus that we have as a, as a country and indoctrinated through a lot of dogma that we have to have a lot of plants in our diet and especially green leafies uh, in order to be healthy. And that somehow if you're consuming a carnivore diet, you're missing these key nutrients. And so let's talk a little bit about some of the benefits, you know, the health benefits. We've talked about them and obviously gut health, but let's talk a little bit about like plant defenses. So what are the things that are in these plants that are making us sick, making us inflamed, um, creating, you know, uh, malabsorption in the gut and, and contributing to a lot of the health issues that we're seeing today? Yeah, great question. There are so many things. And I love that you bring this up about green leafy vegetables because <laughs> I mean, that word is like, that's such a special word these days. People say, mm -hmm. I eat more green leafy vegetables mm -hmm. is practically canon. And I want to be one of the few voices that is saying, wait a minute, I think those are the worst things we can eat. Mm -hmm. And in chapter 12 in the book, I outline what I think of as an animal-based diet and a carnivore mm -hmm. diet and a carnivore-ish type diet. And I draw this spectrum of plant toxicity. I don't think everyone needs to give up all plants, but what I am saying in the book is twofold. And the first is that red meat and all meat has been incorrectly vilified and has been widely, widely denigrated incorrectly, unjustly, and is really an integral part of every human's diet because of the nutrients that are in it that are so unique that you can't get other places. Mm -hmm. It needs to be a part of our diet. There's nothing wrong with red meat. And, and I outline all this in the book and why it's been unjustly criminalized. And the second part of the book is what we can talk about now, which is plants exist on a spectrum of toxicity. They just do. And that if we accept that plants exist on a spectrum of toxicity, we can make the leap intellectually that there are some plants that are going to be triggering for some people more than others. Mm -hmm. And this is not a new concept. This is the idea of a paleo diet or an autoimmune paleo diet or a gluten-free diet is that some plants are more toxic than others. I'm not the first person to say that plants are toxic. I'm one of the first people, or I, I want to be a strong voice saying, hey, the plants you think are good for you are actually some of the plants that are bad for you. Oh, yeah. Most people can get behind the notion that gluten probably isn't good for most people. I don't think it's good for anyone. Mm -hmm. And most people can, you know, saying legumes, saying beans are bad for people is more controversial than gluten. But I think, you know, grains are the one that people are like, I get it, I get it. Grains mm -hmm. are not good for me, but beans are not good for humans either. Anyone that's associated with paleo circles can say, okay, beans are not good for me mm -hmm. either. But take it further down the road. I mean, grains and beans are seeds. They are the reproductive babies of plants. Well, so are nuts and seeds. And so I loop, I lump all of these together and say, hey, these are the parts of the plants, one part of the plant that plants really don't want to get eaten. And if we just think about it from that perspective, we have to anthropomorphize plants a little bit, but I think it's useful in this intellectual construct. Plants and animals have been co-evolving for 450 million years, a long time, way longer than, mm -hmm. than we've been around, way longer than our primate ancestors were around. And plants are stuck in the ground. In the book, I give this analogy of, hey, I'm gonna take you to the beach and bury you up to your neck in the sand. You can't move. And then I'm gonna paint your face like a soccer ball. And then <laughs> what do you know? A whole bunch of irascible, cranky six-year-olds from the soccer practice show up at the beach 
how are you going to feel? You're going to feel vulnerable. Like I, I sure hope those kids don't kick me in the face. Like, right. right. Well, that's how a plant must feel. I mean, I'm looking outside my window at this beautiful tree, but that tree is stuck in the ground mm -hmm. and it's full of leaves. And I'm looking around out my window at all these plants and every single one of those plants is stuck in the ground and any animal, insect, fungus, or human that wants to can walk up to that plant and rip off a branch or a leaf mm -hmm. or a stem or a root and go to town and munch on that plant. Mm -hmm. So what have plants done? They've had this ongoing arms race with animals for hundreds of millions of years. And this is not conjecture. It's not pseudoscience. This is botany. <laughs> and this is well-documented botanical science. And these chemicals broadly are called phytoalexins, which means plant defense chemicals. And we know these exist. Mm -hmm. this, is not, this is not made up fairy tales. And so within the category of plants, there, there are many different types of phytoalexins. I talk about many of them in the book, but I couldn't even cover all of them. Some of them aren't even really meant to be plant defense chemicals. They're just chemicals that plants use in their own body that don't play well in humans. But the types of plant defense chemicals people will be most familiar with are probably things like oxalates. Mm -hmm which are this dicarboxylic acid molecule that chelates minerals and plants. And we make a very small amount of it as a waste product of amino acid breakdown in the human body. And we excrete very small amounts, but we can get 100 to 500 times more oxalate in our diet just by eating a big spinach salad. And if you add something like um, almonds or beets to that, mm -hmm. you can get a really, really big dose of, of oxalate. And the problem with oxalate is that it seems to accumulate in the human body. I talk about all this in the book and I talk about published case studies of mm -hmm. renal failure, of new onset renal failure in a woman doing a green smoothie cleanse. So as you're saying, these we are obsessed with smoothies. We are obsessed mm -hmm. with them. And Rhonda Patrick, Bless her heart. She is well-meaning, but she's, I think she's way off base. And, you know, everyone hears, I need to eat my green smoothie. Well, what are you putting in that green smoothie? Mm -hmm. you're putting, a lot of times you're putting in foods that are super high in oxalates. These smoothies yeah. can have thousands of milligrams of oxalate, which can accumulate in all the tissues of our bodies. Oxalates appear to be able to, de to de be deposited in the thyroid and breast tissue, in all the glands and skin and in the vulva. There's a wide, widely accepted, or there's a pretty strong hypothesis now that this, this vulvar pain syndrome in women could be due to oxalate deposition mm -hmm. in that area. And so that's just one. And then we can talk about lectins, mm -hmm. which are popularized by Stephen Gundry. Um, and these are carbohydrate binding proteins, which really don't play well with our immune system. And lectins occur in both plant and animal foods. And we have lectins in all foods, but the lectins from plants just appear to be less compatible with our biology. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, are lectins really a thing? Well, you ever heard of, you know, ricin? Mm -hmm. You know, this, there was, I mean, people may not know the history, but <clears throat> ricin is a very toxic lectin from castor beans and was the subject of multiple assassination attempts on senators and the president in 2008 and 2003 and 2001. So there are very, very toxic lectins in beans. Mm -hmm. Others are things like phytohemagglutinin <clears throat> in kidney beans, which have caused thousands of cases of kidney bean poisoning. Peanuts have lectins, the legumes, the nuts and seeds are very high in lectins. And mm -hmm. I detail research in the book showing that when we eat these lectins, which again are primarily found in seeds, they appear to interact very badly in our gut. They look like they somehow disable the gut's ability to make mucus. So if, if the listener is familiar with the way the anatomy of our gut looks, we have this endothelium on the inside of our gut, which faces the lumen of the gut, where the poop and bacteria mm -hmm. and food are living. And in there are trillions of bacteria, but this one single cell layer separates the inside of our gut with all the food and bacteria from a huge collection of our, of our immune system in the lamina propria. Mm -hmm. And within that endothelium of the gut, that epithelial lining, there are these special cells called goblet cells that secrete mucus. So there's a mucus lining on the gut. And what appears to happen is that the lectins somehow disable those cells and the lectins cause holes in that mucus layer. They cause that mucus layer to break down and then all these trillions of bacteria come in contact with the gut lining and they initiate an immune response. And we get leaky gut, the immune system opens the junctions between these cells, we get release of zonulin, 
and the immune system pours out into the gut to fight these bacteria, which aren't supposed to be touching the gut lining. Mm. So this is something that's never talked about with lectins, but the, it's primarily happening with plant lectins. It's also been shown to happen with lectins in nightshades and capsicum plants like the spices. So all this spicy food. Well, people may know that when you eat spicy food, you can get a stomach upset. You might get reflux. Sometimes it burns when you poop. Mm -hmm. It's irritating the gut lining. Those are causing leaky gut because the lectins in those foods, whether it's tomato, eggplant, or hot peppers, or even green bell peppers, mm -hmm. all these nightshade and capsicum plants they have these lectins that appear to really piss off the gut lining. <laughs> so that's just lectins and oxalates. And then there's salicylates, mm -hmm. which are common. Sorolins, like I said, carrots and parsnips and parsley have these compounds in them that appear to intercalate, that kind of get stuck in our DNA. And in the DNA in the skin, they predispose us to burning and they increase the incidence of skin cancer. So there are studies that have associated consumption of sorolins in food with skin cancer. And this may sound far-fetched, but we use sorolins to treat psoriasis. And we know that when we use sorolins to treat psoriasis, people have a much higher incidence of skin cancer. So one of the therapies for psoriasis will give people sorolins to put on their skin and then do UV therapy. And it kind of burns off mm -hmm. the psoriasis, which is an autoimmune issue coming from food anyway. But when we do that type of therapy, we have to be very careful with surveillance because it can induce skin cancer. And yet all the time we're being told eat parsley or carrots are less, but they still have it, especially the carrot tops, the greens or parsnips, anything in this family has sorolins. So we've talked about lectins, oxalates, salicylates, sorolins. We haven't even gotten to the big one, which is polyphenols. Mm -hmm. And this is where a lot of cognitive dissonance happens for people. They think polyphenols are good for humans. So, well, I'm not so sure about that. So the human body doesn't make any molecules which are polyphenolic. There's some complex chemistry here. We don't have to go quite down this rabbit hole, but there's these aromatic structures, these carbon rings with electron clouds and aromatic structures of electrons, and they're polyphenolic. There's a simple molecule called phenol, which is a benzene ring and a hydroxyl group attached, which is a known carcinogen, but a polyphenolic structure is multiple aromatic rings. Well, the human body doesn't make those structures, but plants do. And so many of the chemicals we've been told are good for us, resveratrol, curcumin, are polyphenolic. Yeah. And this is something that's very counterintuitive. This is probably one of the most controversial things I say in the book. If you look at all the research on these molecules, we find that though some myopic research can show a benefit, when you expand the lens, there's a ton of studies that were never told about that show detriment. Mm -hmm. I did an interview with David Sinclair on my podcast, mm -hmm. and I've openly debated with him about resveratrol. Resveratrol is clearly known to worsen metabolic function. It causes more insulin resistance. It also worsens androgen metabolism. It decreases male hormone precursors in humans because it's a phytoestrogen. It mimics mm -hmm. estrogen in the human body. There have been published studies with prostate cancer showing that resveratrol lowers androgen precursors in a negative way. So if you want to decrease your testosterone, which is important for both men and women, resveratrol will do that, but it's a very bad thing. You don't wanna yeah. do that. We don't want these <laughs> molecules. And then it, the list goes on and on. Curcumin has been shown to damage DNA, to inhibit the enzymes that coil and uncoil DNA called topoisomerases. Curcumin also, uh, inhibits or affects P53, which is a tumor suppressor gene, and it can damage or affect negatively this potassium channel called the Herg channel. This is just the tip of the iceberg. I talk about all this stuff in the book, but it all makes sense when you kind of step back because plants don't want to get eaten. As I said, kale's not your friend, broccoli's mm -hmm. not that into you, and spinach just really, it's not really good for you. These plants don't want to get eaten, and especially the roots the stems, the leaves, and the seeds. Now, fruit is a whole different story, which we can talk about. Plants generally don't put as many toxins in the fruit, but just think like a plant. Mm -hmm. There have to be toxins in these foods. People will say, well, what about animals? How do animals eat these plants? Well, they've evolved eating those plants exclusively. They have a much more sophisticated system of detoxification. They have different P450 systems in their body. They have a different enzymatic detoxification system in their liver. We don't really have that because as I talk about in the very beginning of the book, it, there's really good anthropologic data from stable isotopes, from historical records, from 
anthropologic archaeologic records and looking at the teeth and the bones that we've been mostly eating animals mm -hmm. for the last couple of million years. And, and we haven't been herbivores. So we can get into all that. So I think we've kind of gone away, though, though we appear to have evolved from primates who are omnivorous and eating the majority plants. We took a big left turn about 2 million years ago. We see the size of the human brain explode with the onset or with sort of contemporary with lots of evidence that we started hunting and we started hunting a lot. Mm -hmm. And as you say, the mainstream doesn't realize that meat is the most digestible thing. And we're always told, oh, it's going to ferment in your gut. It's going to putrefy. It's just, you know, you have five pounds of undigested meat in your gut. It's like, I don't know where people come up with this because it's not true at all. Uh, so anyway, that was a long winded answer, but those are just, it's so many deep rabbit holes to go down. I'm sure by now you've heard me or others talk about the benefits of using CBD oil. And I'm telling you that it works. Direct CBD Online provides natural alternatives to prescription painkillers and medications. They sell only the highest quality CBD oils, edibles, creams, and more to help you on your search for natural well being. And they strive to assist you in making informed decisions about your health and the products and supplements you use. If you've been thinking about trying out CBD, I highly encourage you to use Direct CBD Online. Click the link in the description to get started today. Well, it's also fascinating and and you, uh, of course, do it so incredibly eloquently. I know when I was reading those chapters and, and talking to a family member and saying like, I know you're a reformed vegan and I'm so grateful that you're now eating animal products. And when you really think about these things, I think we're conditioned that we should all eat salad and we should all eat lots of, you know, eat the rainbow, you know, that's, that's what we should be doing. And I think it all comes down to bio-individuality because- you know, I'm, I'm in my forties now. And so I, I kind of feel like a lot of what you can get away with when you're younger, as you kind of hit middle age, it, it separates the, the boys from the girls. And in terms of, you know, if you've been taking care of yourself, you know, what is your health looking like? What's your sleep quality? Like, um, are you exercising? Do you fast? Um, do you consume too much alcohol? I mean, all these things can really contribute to susceptibility to disease. And I think given, you know, what's going on in the world, it would be um, I would be remiss if we didn't at least address the global pandemic of COVID. But when we start talking about susceptibility to disease and the choices that we're making and the foods that we're choosing to eat, it really is important because it all starts with food. Um, and I've, I've watched, you know, some of the discussions that are going on Twitter and Instagram and people, a lot of the healthcare providers are talking about susceptibility to COVID. And it definitely looks like the choices that we make in terms of nutrition and lifestyle have a large impact on our susceptibility to not only COVID, but other, you know, metabolic uh, syndromes. So I would love for you to kind of talk a little bit about how our diets that we're consuming can either really benefit us in terms from an immunological perspective or make us much more susceptible to um, infectious diseases and otherwise. Absolutely. There's no shortage of data now showing that comorbid conditions, especially comorbid conditions connected with insulin resistance, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, prediabetes, obesity, increased visceral adiposity, so many are, are clearly correlated with 10x risk of severe COVID, as is low vitamin D status, which can also be a marker of insulin, uh, insulin resistance and metabolic mm -hmm. dysfunction. And there was a great paper that came out in Cell recently showing that glycemic variability was very highly correlated with worse COVID outcomes. Mm -hmm. And yet I haven't really heard the mainstream media talking about this. Mm -hmm. To me, it's very sad that most of what we hear is fear-based and mm -hmm. be afraid, be afraid, be afraid, when there's very little information about what you can do mm -hmm. and how you can improve your metabolic health. I did a podcast on my podcast, which is called Fundamental Health with a UK physician that I'm friends with, Asim Malhotra. And in that podcast, we talked about a really interesting study done by Robert Lustig a number of years ago mm -hmm. in which they removed processed sugar. They removed high fructose corn syrup and sugar sweetened beverages from obese children's diets. And that was all they did. They were isocaloric diets, the same macronutrient ratios, mm -hmm. same ratios of fat, protein, and carbohydrates. And within nine days, these kids had improvement in all of the markers of insulin sensitivity area under the curve, fasting insulin, mean amplitude glucose excursions, 
fasting, you know, fasting levels of glucose. So within nine days, they had improvements in insulin sensitivity. Originally, when I started talking about this stuff on Instagram and saying, hey, obesity is the real pandemic, metabolic mm -hmm. health is the real pandemic, I received criticism, which I always appreciate and want to engage with to some extent. People saying, you can't tell people to lose weight in the middle of a pandemic. It won't happen fast enough. And now I think they're completely wrong mm -hmm. because the pandemic has been going on for 10 weeks, mm -hmm. 10 weeks. How many times over could we have seen improvements in metabolic health in those individuals? How many mm -hmm. nine day cycles is 10 weeks? It's a lot, right. you know, right. it's like seven cycles. We had, we had seven times nine to get to that mm -hmm. point. So it's not even, it's not even questionable that we could have saved thousands of lives, both from COVID mm -hmm. and also from long-term metabolic consequences within a 10 week period. If the messaging at the beginning had been, Hey, diabetes, pre-diabetes, insulin resistance, junk food, processed carbohydrates, fats, mm -hmm. processed vegetable oils, processed sugars. These are the real killers. Mm -hmm. Don't eat these. If you want to be healthy from COVID, if you want to get, if you want to have a better outcome, if you contact coronavirus, stop eating these foods. Do you know how many people we could have saved? Like it's, right. it, to me, that's the greatest travesty. That's the greatest tragedy. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no denying the fact that tens of thousands of people have lost their lives to this illness and it could have been a lot lower and it could have mm -hmm. been a lot lower in the next five to 10 years. If that had been the motivating factor, I fear we've missed a critical uh, moment in our history to say to people, metabolic illness is the killer, put down the Cheetos. Right. And instead, what we're seeing is articles, um, you know, I posted this article, you know, Pop Sugar, I, I shouldn't be surprised. Pop Sugar had an article, it's okay to stress eat during the pandemic. You're very stressed, it's okay to stress eat. And, you know, Dr. Asima Hocha was getting pushback from endocrinologists saying, I'm gonna eat a donut today. And I can't tell you how many of my friends who are still in residency or, or are attendings at hospitals are sending me photos of residents on call with pizzas, saying pizza's health food for residents on the coronavirus service. Or I had someone send me pictures today. He's a nurse in the ICU and they're giving free food to these nurses in the hospitals. And he didn't want to be identified because he's afraid he'd lose his job. Sure. He, what would he send me a picture of? It was all sugar. It was all sugar and junk food, every single piece of it. So I just don't understand where the mainstream media disconnect mm -hmm. or where the mainstream ideological disconnect is to say, wait a minute, what you eat could affect your coronavirus status. Right. <laughs> like, I think that the media wants us to feel as though we're powerless and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I just, that's just what I see because there mm -hmm. hasn't been a whole lot of media coverage of the vitamin D data. No. And there certainly has been no, no coverage of the glycemic variability data, but what's the answer? It's very simple. It doesn't even have to be a carnivore diet. Just cut out processed carbohydrates, mm -hmm. processed vegetable oils and processed sugars. And you know, there you go. And you're, you're there, you know, you're absolutely, you're, you're basically getting out to ultra processed foods. You can see a real improvement. Now, do I think you could do better than that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And in the podcast that I've done over the last few weeks, which have mostly been focused on coronavirus as well, I've been talking, what nutrients do we know the immune system needs to function properly? Zinc, copper, manganese, selenium. Mm -hmm. There's a great paper that came out recently looking at China and selenium data for coronavirus um, severity, probably connected with glutathione peroxidase. Mm -hmm. That enzyme is selenium dependent. And so what do we know? Where do we get those minerals? We get them from animals. Mm -hmm. You can try and get them from plants, but as I talk about in the book, and as I talk about in the carnivore code, they're just not that bioavailable in plants mm -hmm. because of phytic acid and oxalate, that dicarboxylic acid molecule. And then what about the B vitamins? Well, we know riboflavin, niacin, pyridoxine, B12, folate, much more bioavailable in animal foods. So in my opinion, if you want to have a healthy immune system, you really should be eating animal foods. You just can't get those minerals and vitamins without them. And if the listener is doubting this, I challenge anyone to get even 100% of the RDA for riboflavin eating only plants in a day. You can't do it. You can't do it. And the riboflavin that's in those plants is less bioavailable because they're usually conjugated to sugars. So you just can't get the B vitamins you need you certainly can't get enough heme iron. You won't get enough selenium unless you're chugging Brazil nuts every day. You're going to get deficient in all these things unless you have animal foods in your diet. And again, my message is not, you only need to have animal foods, but 
realize they're good for you and then understand there's a spectrum of plant toxicity, but absolutely you're right. We know that the way you eat metabolic health, nutritional status is the key. And the last thing I'll say is that we're seeing age as the main risk factor for coronavirus outcomes for severe COVID. And people, you know, want to say, oh, it's being old. You get frail when you get old. That's the same kind of false thinking that, that drove me away from, you know, drove me away from mainstream medicine previously. Who says you need to have those things happen when you get old? I think that age is a major risk factor for coronavirus because there's more insulin resistance, mm -hmm. because there's worse nutritional status. How many 70 or 80 year olds do you know who can take the time to make a steak or eat a steak or eat animal foods? So often as we get older, we're just eating more and more processed foods because it's this slow decline. We have this inexorable march to decrepitude because we've been doing bad things since our forties. And by the time we get to be 60, all we want to do is eat bagels or mm -hmm. tea and toast was the adage in medical school. Well, how much zinc, magnesium, manganese, copper, selenium, riboflavin, pyridoxine, and niacin are in tea and toast mm, or cool. processed food, almost mm -hmm. none. Yeah. So that's, that in my opinion is the reason that elderly are at so much risk. And where are they dying? They're dying in nursing homes. Well, how's the food in a nursing home? Oh yeah, there's no yeah. sugar or vegetable oil in a nursing home and they're giving them lots of liver and egg yolks, right? They're just, it's garbage food everywhere. So we need to be very careful with our characterizations. And I really hope, though I'm not holding my breath, that the mainstream media wakes up to this fact and we don't miss this opportunity to crystallize in the minds of the public that this is critical because people are scared out of their minds. Mm -hmm. And if we said to them, hey, walk, lose weight, change your diet, and you'll be safer if you touch coronavirus, which most people will, that I think could have a profound effect, but it wouldn't be good for the bottom line of the processed food companies. Who knows? It's challenging times. It, it really is. And there's a book I read a few years ago um, called Salt, Sugar, Fat. And it was really the first time I had this eye-opening perspective about the processed food industry and how they design foods to be truly as addictive as possible. This whole bliss point that they talk about and you know, one of the things that I saw evolve over my 20 years of working in clinical medicine first as an ER nurse and then as a nurse practitioner was that we are largely giving away control of so many things to the processed food industry and and kind of taking a step back from our own health and, and some accountability. And by this, I mean, it could look very different for everyone, but I think it's really critical that we prioritize taking care of us so that we can take care of everyone else. And that looks like making sure you get enough sleep, you know, making the best choices of what you have available to you. Everyone's budgets are different. And, and much like to your point that you said, you know, um, not everyone necessarily has to eat an all meat diet, but at least incorporating animal products in and, and finding what plant foods, if any, really agree with your body. I know when I left the hospital last year, uh, the one thing I craved was red meat. In fact, I dreamed, I dreamed of hamburgers when I was in the hospital. That's all I thought about. And I wasn't able to eat for like 11 days. And so when I came out, all I wanted was beef. And when I was finally able to clementines, for some reason, my body wanted the vitamin C from the clementine, but that was the only thing that my body could tolerate. So I think that that's, that all comes back to talk about how we have to take a proactive stance as it pertains to our health and not just assume the processed food industry is looking out for our benefits because it really is not. They are certainly not. Uh, <laughs> there's no question about that. And, you know, not to sound judgmental, but, you know, I've got this apartment in California. I'm moving to Texas soon. It looks out um, onto some trees in a parking lot. And I'll see people walk into the apartment and I'm always like, and I'll see them walking in with food. And I, I just, the majority of the time, they're not walking in with groceries. They're right. walking in with pizza, mm -hmm. processed food, sugary drinks, and they're wearing masks. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a disconnect here, you guys. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Right. And when I go to the grocery store, I always am a little bit voyeuristic. I'll peek into other people's carts. Mm -hmm. The majority of those carts are boxes and bags mm -hmm. and processed food. And I live in North County, San Diego right now. I live in an affluent area mm -hmm. where people are happy and they're at the beach. They're not, I mean, there's no question the education is here. Mm -hmm. And yet very few people are eating real food. And again, I think that animal foods are the best things, but very few people are even eating real plant food. <laughs> Most people are eating processed food. And 
what do we know about the sales of food during this pandemic? When, when, when everything hit the fan, what was sold out, it was processed food and grains and things that would keep, and you know, you couldn't keep chips on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And people might say, oh, well, that stuff keeps for a long time. Well, I don't think people are stockpiling chips because they're so bulky, you know, but people went to junk food very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think that in general, it just is a, is a magnification of what the buying habits of the public are. And I don't work in a grocery store, but it would be really interesting to ask them, how many products do you sell that are processed food versus meat versus unprocessed food in a day? I've got a suspicion that they're turning over the processed foods way more quickly than they're turning over the other foods. And, you know, New York Times has done multiple pieces on this. Junk food sales are up. Alcohol sales are up. Yeah. One of my friends said something that I thought was very insightful. He said, why didn't we put a quarantine on junk food? I right. Thought, well, people would revolt. Like toilet <laughs> but, paper. You can't yeah. find toilet paper anywhere. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if, I, if I were king, junk food would have been illegal during this pandemic. You want to, you want to solve the coronavirus pandemic or you want to make it as, you want to make it as, you know, as small or as less, you know, the least painful as possible. Mm -hmm. Junk food's illegal guys. I'm sorry. Go through your sugar withdrawal, no sugar, no junk food, no processed food. Probably the concern is we'd run out of all either food. <laughs> you couldn't right. feed people, but theoretically that's, that's what we need to do. And I think that that gets to very, very complex discussions about socio-political norms and farm mm -hmm. subsidies and why those foods are so popular and agribusiness funding of mainstream media, which is probably something we don't have time to go down the rabbit hole today. Right, but right. I've got to suspect that it's not good business to tell people to eat whole foods in connection with coronavirus when the commercials are you know, Jello and fruit roll-ups. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what commercials are. I don't watch TV anymore, but yeah. you tell me, I mean, I don't know. Your listeners can tell me what the commercials are between, uh, between the news segments. It's probably pharmaceuticals and, you know, cheese it. Yeah. I think that's, it's interesting. I was just saying to someone the other day that largely our TV is never on. I have teenage boys. So occasionally as a family, we will watch a movie, but we stream. So it's like the concept of what commercials are out there. I have no idea. I just know the pharmaceutical companies are probably doing really well because people are doing nothing more than sitting in front of their TVs. So let's pivot a little bit. Let's talk about some of the things, you know, these hermetic stressors, these things that we can do proactively for our body. Um, obviously, intermittent fasting is one of the things I kind of hang my hat on as being, you know, can be beneficial for our health. But what are some of the other ways other than you know, pivoting the way that we're choosing to eat and timing about when we're eating, what are some of the other things we can do to benefit our health um, beneficially? So in the book, I draw this distinction between molecular hormesis and environmental hormesis, which I've never heard anyone else do this. It was just mm -hmm. a concept that I came up with when I was writing the book. But for people who aren't familiar, the concept of hormesis or a hormetic stressor is Colloquially known as a small amount of a poison is good for you. It's kind of like that scene in The Princess Bride where they're talking about iocane powder. And hopefully people have heard this or otherwise it's going to be completely <laughs> lost on them. <laughs> you know, but the, the Dread Pirate Roberts is in this, this iocane powder drinking contest with uh, the Italian. Um, and, and he says, I've been doing small amounts of iocane powder for years. And he's developed this resistance against it. And so within colloquial speech, within common parlance, People think of hormesis like, okay, aren't these plant chemicals beneficial for me from a hormetic perspective? And I debate that notion. And I contrast molecular hormesis, which is the hormesis that might happen mm -hmm. with plant molecules with environmental hormesis. So I think that we, this concept of xenohormesis or molecular hormesis from plants was, was taken from what we know of as environmental hormesis, which is the fact that a small amount of sunlight is good for us. A large amount will give us a burn and a smaller amount will give us a burn if we're eating lots of sorolins. Mm -hmm. And exercise, a moderate amount of exercise is good for us, but if you train for a marathon every day, you're going to get fatigued and you're going to crash. Um, you can only lift so much weight before your muscle explodes. So mm -hmm. a small amount of a stressor will cause the body to be stronger. There's lots of talk now about sauna and cold plunging, and this is environmental hormesis. There's a study I talk about in the book in which 
cold water swimmers in Berlin were observed. And after a one hour cold water swim, akin to a cold plunge, their glutathione levels went down, suggesting mm-hmm. that they had some oxidative stress. Mm-hmm. And they look at them the next day and their glutathione levels are back up above normal. This is hormesis. Mm-hmm. This is exactly what happens with exercise and sunlight and these environmental things. The same could be said of sauna, mm-hmm. with heat shock proteins, the hormesis that happens there. And the point that I suggest in the book is that we don't need plant molecules to be ideal from an antioxidant perspective. So much of the narrative around plants has been, oh, you need this sulforaphane molecule because it'll increase your glutathione. Well, that's not really true if you look at the studies. Though you can do a small study and show that sulforaphane will increase the production of glutathione by turning on the antioxidant enzymes, by turning on the NRF2 system in the liver because it is in fact a pro-oxidant. Many of these antioxidants have been misunderstood. They're all pro-oxidants, right? These are pro-oxidants. They turn on the NRF2 system in the liver, which causes you to make more glutathione in response. They don't actually act as antioxidants in the human body. This is incorrectly imagined or described human physiology. But why do you need sulforaphane if you already get enough glutathione from being in the sun, cold plunging, and uh, hormetic stressors like exercise or sauna? And the response is, well, what about more? Wouldn't more be better? And the answer is no, because if you look at the studies that I show in the book, if you're doing those things, it doesn't look like sulforaphane gives you any more glutathione. It's the my experiments that have been done are myopic. In the setting of uh, their sort of contrived models, you can show that glutathione will go up with sulforaphane. But when you look at free living humans who are consuming more fruits and vegetables versus humans who are consuming less fruits and vegetables in a controlled experiment, There's no difference in the antioxidant markers, overall oxidative stress, markers of lipid peroxidation or markers of DNA damage saying, where's this real fairy tale benefit from these plant molecules? I don't see it. It doesn't exist for many people. And the piece that so often gets missed is that these plant molecules also come with side effects. Mm -hmm. They come with detrimental effects. We hinted at this earlier. So fluorophane doesn't just turn on the NRF2 system in the liver. It also causes lipid peroxidation in your membranes of your cells and competes with iodine, the level of the thyroid for uptake, causing thyroid issues. Mm -hmm. So the question, the very real, very sobering question that I ask the reader in the book is, why would you take a plant molecule that has side effects for a benefit that's redundant? Why would you take sulforaphane to increase your glutathione when you know sulforaphane has negative side effects, when you don't need more glutathione if you're doing these environmental hormetic activities? The other thing I mentioned is that ketosis is hormetic. Mm -hmm. And ketosis turns on a lot of the same genes that resveratrol does. So back to the resveratrol example, why would you take a molecule like resveratrol that is going to negatively affect your hormones for both men and women, that is negatively going to worsen your metabolic health and decrease glucose handling or mess up glucose handling when you can get the same benefits to the sirtuin genes by doing intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding, or occasional low carb days, or extended fasting. You can get all the same genes turned on by fasting or by doing periods of not eating. If you want more NAD relative to NADH, just go into ketosis. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do it every day. You can just do a time-restricted feeding window. That's the way to get more NAD. But David Sinclair won't tell you that because he's talking about NR and NMN, nicotinamide riboside, Mm -hmm. nicotinamide mononucleotide, And as I talk about, and as I challenge him on my podcast when he came on, the problem with tons of those is those are niacin derivatives, which are going to mess up your B vitamin metabolism. And they're going to use up methyl groups. You can't take NR and NMN unless you have plenty of methyl groups. You're going to have to have plenty of methylfolate, plenty of riboflavin. You're going to need extra betaine. You're going to need trimethylglycine, which is the same as betaine. So it gets into complex esoteric biochemistry. But the point here, the point I'm making in the book is I believe you can get all the benefits we need. We can be optimal just by being in our environment, just by living what I would call a radical life, just by being in the sun, exercising, being in cold water, sauna. That's how we get these environmental hormetics. We don't need plant hormetics to be optimal in any way, shape, or form, and they come with all these attendant side effects. So it's a little bit of a complex concept, and it's definitely contrary to the mainstream thinking, Mm -hmm. but 
in my mind, the literature supports this very strongly that we don't need these plant molecules and we definitely don't need all their negative side effects. I think it's really compelling. And, and I'm thinking a lot about um, Wim Hof is so popular right now. And a lot of people are using some of these hermetic stressors. They're, you know, maybe they're ending their shower with a minute or two of cold water therapy. And one of these things are kind of tapping us back into that parasympathetic rest and repose. Most of us are sympathetic dominant running normally running around in our crazy uh, kind of frenetic lives. I definitely want to touch on oxalates because I feel like that in particular in terms of plant toxicities is one that people are very surprised. I think people hear the word, they don't really know what that represents. I know for myself, many myself and many of the people that are in the gluten-free community end up getting a lot of oxalates. You know, we're eating a lot of nuts, a lot of nut flowers, um, and not realizing that some of our gut issues are actually exacerbated by these particular plant toxins. I actually had a uh, an oxalate expert on a few weeks ago. And, you know, even with all my training, I thought I was fairly knowledgeable about oxalates. And yet some of the information that's also echoed in your book, she was talking about, and, and I was trying to explain to someone that, you know, we we kind of in the Western medicine model, think about oxalates in terms of kidney stones, but it's so much more than that. And you even touched on how it can deposit itself in some of the tissues where I typically see a lot of issues with oxalates is people start either getting loose stools, um, they end up getting bound up, they get constipated, um, and not even realizing that some of their brain fog issues can be exacerbated by the oxalates. Do you find that of the plant toxins that you're talking about, is that one that people are usually more surprised about, or is it a constellation of all of them? I think that people are very surprised about oxalates, and we've never heard the term, and it's mm -hmm. organic chemistry, so it's very hard to conceptualize. What's an oxalate? What is oxalic right. acid? Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. The most common kidney stone is calcium oxalate kidney stones, mm -hmm. and why do we get calcium oxalate kidney stones? Well, because we're eating more oxalates in our diet and that's, mm -hmm. that's mainstream medicine thinking. Mm -hmm. If you've had a calcium oxalate kidney stone, mainstream medicine will tell you to limit high oxalate foods. What foods are those? Almonds, spinach, rhubarb, beets, mm -hmm. many. I have a whole list in my book, mm -hmm. but they won't really connect the dots and say, that's probably what happened in the first place. That's why you got the kidney stone in the first place. And yet, why would any of us want to, you know, put ourselves at risk for a kidney stone by eating lots of oxalates. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm friends with Liam Hemsworth. Um, and, and, you know, his story is now public that, that he had kidney stones as a vegan and he had a calcium oxalate kidney stone. I'm hoping to have him on my podcast soon. Uh, he benefited greatly by including animal foods in his diet. Mm -hmm. So this is not, this is not uncommon. My dad had a kidney stone. I said, dad, what did you do? He said, oh, I increased spinach in my diet. You know, this was before he helped me edit my book and he read the book. And so people don't get it. And mm -hmm. the most striking things I found with oxalates were that they're found in breast tissue. And there are researchers who believe that they're potentially a nidus for breast cancer. I saw that. And that they're connected with ductal carcinoma in situ and lobular carcinoma in situ. And that you can inject oxalates into a mammary fat pad of um, mice and rats and see cancers develop. And they're, they're, they're really not a good thing in the human body. You can also get a ton of oxalates by eating chocolate. And mm -hmm. you know, this is the Valentine's Day massacre probably for people, <laughs> two to four ounces of chocolate, which is not a small amount, can mm -hmm. give you the same amount of oxalate in your kidneys that people who have a condition called primary hyperoxaluria have. And what we know about people with primary hyperoxaluria is that they get systemic oxalosis, the distribution of oxalate throughout their body. They often get kidney stones that are so bad that they have to be lithotripsied or surgically removed. And they, they usually have renal failure eventually because their oxalate levels are so high. So, and primary hyperoxalosis is a deficiency or a defect in one of the enzymes of um, the glyoxalate pathway, which breaks down proline and hydroxyproline into oxalate in the human body. So they produce more oxalate because of mutations in this genetic pathway, but we can, we can create equivalent levels of oxalate excretion in the kidney and oxalate circulating in the body by eating two to four ounces of chocolate. Well, imagine what happens when you eat a green smoothie. Mm -hmm. And you know, every once in a while, probably not a big deal unless somebody's very sensitive, but every day, big problem or big doses for many times. I mean, but when people eat green smoothies, they don't just eat one green smoothie a month. Maybe some people do, but they go on kicks they eat them every day. Days, and, and, yeah. yeah. And then when you think about how many foods have oxalate in them, it's pretty common. And yeah. oxalates are used also by, by plants as defense chemicals. They have multiple forms. 
in plants. There's a raphide form, which looks like a needle. And there are some plants like Diffenbachia that will actually shoot the needle at, at animals and insects to kind of dissuade them from eating them. So they're pretty, they're pretty vicious little, little things. No, no kidding. Well, I'd love for you to kind of wrap up and, and walk us through what a typical day is like for you. I know that you're a huge proponent of, you know, uh, nose to tail. So what is a typical day like for you in terms of what are your meals like putting them together? I think people are really curious. They're like, you just eat meat. And I'm like, yeah, sometimes we just eat meat. Yeah. So I just released a video on my Instagram and YouTube, what I eat in a day. People can watch that if they want to see what I eat. When everyone, everybody always asks me the same question, you just eat meat? And I say, well, not really. I eat eggs. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I eat seafood and I eat organs and I eat bone broth. And recently I've been eating honey um, as an experiment and, and really enjoying sort of the metabolic flexibility that comes with some carbohydrate in my diet without fiber. And I've been wearing a continuous glucose monitor just to check my blood sugar responses and finding it quite fascinating and really not finding mm -hmm. that my blood sugar goes through the roof or is massively elevated or that by eating honey, I'm developing insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. So I eat two meals a day. I eat in a pretty small eating window. I like to eat around eight o'clock in the morning and I'll try and finish my last meal by two or 3 p.m. I don't eat dinner. I think dinner is the most overrated meal of the day. <laughs> and that's the reverse of what many people do. Most people will, will do time restricted feeding and start later in the day. I like to start earlier. I eat breakfast and a late lunch and I'm done. And so I always have 16, 18 hours of fasting overnight, which means that even though I'm eating honey during the day, I'm almost certainly in ketosis in the morning, meaning that I have some periods in the day where I'm anabolic and then overnight, hopefully, theoretically, doing some house cleaning, turning on AMP kinase, turning off mTOR, getting those longevity genes turned on, getting ketones going, changing that NAD to NADH ratio throughout the day, kind of you know, cycling back and forth. But that's kind of the beauty of intermittent fasting is you can still eat during the day and you can even eat safer carbohydrates during the day and yet shift that NAD to NADH ratio with ketosis during that time period when, you, um, when you're fasting. So uh, again, I'll finish my last meal. Both meals of the day are about the same. I'm about 175 pounds now. Um, I'm 5'10". Pretty lean these days, maybe 8% mm -hmm. body fat. And I, I'll eat about a pound and three quarters of meat per day plus mm -hmm. organs. So I go for about 175 grams of protein per day. I've been eating a lot of stew meat recently. Mm -hmm. I find it to be very affordable. I will only eat organic grass-fed, grass-finished meat. Mm -hmm. I strongly believe in supporting regenerative farms like white oak pastures. And um, I'll just, I'll eat some stew meat and then I'll eat uh, egg yolks. I like uh, egg yolks and I'll have some organs. So at breakfast this morning, I had about three fourths of a pound of stew meat, four egg yolks and uh, about three ounces of liver. And then I had some honey with that and I had some bone broth and tendons. So that was breakfast. You can imagine that's pretty filling, yeah. I'm not hungry. I don't snack, I don't have to. At two o'clock, 2.30 today, I'll eat quote dinner. Mm -hmm. And it'll be about the same. I'll have maybe a pound of um, stew meat, some egg yolks. Um, I like Redmond Real Salt. And I'll have the other organs that I have in stock right now. So I've got some pancreas, some spleen, some testicle, and I'll eat those at dinner. And most people go, oh, that's gross. I can never eat that. You don't have to eat that. That's just how I do it. Mm -hmm. I think nose to tail is a way to honor the animal. And the organs are much more palatable than people believe but there are all sorts of ways to do this. There are desiccated organ supplements you can do if you can get if you wanna get the organs in otherwise. But um, whenever anyone asks me what I eat, I always think, well, just because I eat this way doesn't mean everyone needs to eat this way. In, in the carnivore code, I outline five tiers that people can use and kind of fit it into their life however they want. I like the organs. I find them to be a very unique food. They're very affordable. And I think they have unique nutritional properties. Like we talked about earlier, riboflavin, tons in liver, a good amount in kidney too, but really not a whole lot of other places, a little bit in heart, but much more than muscle meat, riboflavin is there. And then you think choline, selenium, mm -hmm. manganese, zinc, copper, so many of these nutrients are uniquely positioned in the organ meats, not to mention peptides and other signaling factors. Um, spleen is clearly the best source of heme iron and spleen has been shown to have these kind of interesting peptides in it, splenin, tuftsin, and splenopentin, which 
have some pretty unique roles, at least in rodent models. We've never really studied these peptides in, in humans, but in animal models, they seem to have very unique, you know, kind of energy inducing, kind of longevity inducing properties in animals. So are there unique peptides and signaling molecules and organs that we're missing? I think there are. And eating as much of them as possible, I think is a good thing. It doesn't have to be a ton, but at least liver and start with some of the more palatable ones. This is what we're missing in our, in our diet right now. Uh, is is the organ meats and our ancestors always ate them. They always prized them. They were like the most important part of the animal generally. Well, it's interesting. So I was raised by an Italian mom and it was con every single week my mom would cook up liver and my brother and I still laugh about this because it was our least favorite meal of the week. My mom would cook up bacon with it to entice us to eat it. I'm curious how you cook your liver. Do you just saute? I mean, just out of curiosity, how do you make it as palatable for you as possible? You know, the more I eat it, the more palatable it becomes. Uh, you can just cook it, you can pan, fry it, saute it. Um, one of the things that I do with liver that people may not be totally excited about is I'll eat it raw. Okay. So I'll get my liver from good sources that I trust. It's organic, it's grass fed, mm -hmm. pretty darn safe. It's been frozen for a long mm -hmm. amount of time and I'll thaw it out, cut it up into small pieces and just kind of swallow it. Do like okay. liver shooters, kind of take it like a vitamin. There was a, a meme on Instagram. We were joking uh, some time ago called the frozen liver gang. We would just, mm -hmm. you can cut it up into small pieces and chew this frozen liver. It's, it's different than what we're used to as humans if we've never eaten liver, but it's, it's really not that bad. It's pretty darn palatable. And once you get used to the, the irony flavor and you can appreciate that as a nutrient rich, mm -hmm. it starts to be really good. Liver can actually be pretty sweet. Well, that's good to know. And thank you again for your time. How can our listeners, how can they find you? So you can find my book, thecarnivorecodebook.com. Depending when this podcast comes out, um, the first edition of the book, The Carnivore Code, will be for sale until the end of May. In June and July, the second edition will be pre-ordered on Amazon and everywhere. So uh, the book will be re-released in August, on August the 4th, with the ebook, the print, and the audio book, which I recorded in my voice. And that's through Houghton Mifflin. So we're going to get much broader distribution, but you can find it thecarnivorecodebook.com. My website is carnivoremd. And on all the socials, I am at carnivoremd. And I've got a podcast of my own fundamental health. People can check that out as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been incredibly informative. And I know that my listeners will really enjoy listening to all that you have to say. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to Everyday Wellness. If you loved this episode, please leave us a rating and review, subscribe, and remember, tell a friend. And if you want to connect with us online, visit the link in the show notes.